Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 51. The first one on the other side of 50, ladies and gentlemen. This episode is Mallory Conlon, and she is amazing. She's an astronomer. Let that sink in. Yes, she is an astronomer, okay? And I love having educators on my show because I learned so much, and this episode was no different. I learned a ton, and I'm sure you guys are as well. Um, We talk about different types of telescopes, how she first got into astronomy, um, exoplanets, uh, different accents. We talk about uh, the difference between facts and theories. Uh, all, Dude, all kinds of stuff. And you can't have an astronomer on and not talk about Pluto. Have you ever wondered why Pluto is no longer a planet? Well, we find out here. Um, unless you're in Illinois. You'll know what that means soon. Uh, yeah, so she's great. She's also the host of a podcast called The Avatar State Pod. And anyone who knows me knows I'm a massive Avatar The Last Airbender fan. It's actually in my theme song, which you're about to hear. Um, But we talk about that show, all kinds of really cool stuff. Mallory is great. Um, And you guys, guys, I'm so excited to have this show released because I've been sitting on it for a while. Having banked all these episodes, um, you know, you bank them up and then you have to release them. And that is why uh, it's fitting that Mallory is going to be the last episode in... Uh, March, which was the double release month that I've been doing. Um, yeah, so it just, it came full circle. You know, I'm so glad to have this one out there. I'm so glad Mallory took the time to talk to me and teach me things that I had no idea about. Uh, so without further ado, I've talked enough. Let's go learn about some space and stuff. That was an unintentional rhyme. What? I'm into it. Anyway, please enjoy the interesting podcast, episode number 51 with Mallory Conlon. Theme song time. Hello, how are you? Uh, good, how's it going? It is going very well, it's going very well. How are you doing? Wonderful, very good. Happy that I could make it work so quickly after you asked me to do this. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. No prob. Uh, just checking some levels really quick. And... Yeah, no prob. Let me know if my mic is okay or if it sounds grubby. It sounds great. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, you sound good. Cool, cool. That is a uh, phase one complete. Good, excellent. Yeah, I on had, our way. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I had uh, uh, I'm not gonna say which guest, but uh, at the time that this goes up, it will have been a while ago. But mm-hmm. I I was skyping full on, uh, like with video and everything, and it was going great. But then I realized that the recorder that I have only records audio from audio calls, so it doesn't oh, record. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, the first like 15 minutes, it didn't record because we were actually talking. So I was like, "Hold on, let me let me turn the let me turn the uh the video off." And then it started sure. recording their side. I was oh like, no. This is the worst. You think <laughs> 40 episodes in I'd have learned how to do this. <laughs> it's every once in a while you learn new things and sometimes yes. it's the hard way. <laughs> um it's always the hard way in, yeah. in my experience. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> so you're an hour behind me, correct? I'm in Central Time, not Connecticut, so Uh I believe then I am an hour behind you if you're on the East Coast. Okay. Yes, I'm in Florida. (laughs) Cool. Yeah, so it's 9.30 where I'm at. Very nice, very nice. So you are 8.30 where you are. I can tell you an hour into the future. It's not bad. It's not bad. The world still exists? Yeah, I mean... (laughs) I can't speak for where you are, but uh, okay. <laughs> Florida's, Florida's, <still> <laughs> Florida's there somehow, some way they made it into That's right. 9.33 Yes, PM. somehow, <laughs> against our everything that we've tried, it's, uh, we're, we're still around. There uh, you go. Whereabouts are you located? What state? So I'm in Madison, Wisconsin. That explains the accent. Are you... <laughs> <laughs> 
So that's something that everybody talks to me about when they first hear my voice. They're like, oh, where are you from? So I am from the Midwest. I'm actually from the Chicago area in Illinois, just displaced in Madison, Wisconsin. So for some reason, my my voice just uh, has that extra Midwest twang to it that everybody seems to notice. That's really funny. (laughs) It's, It's the A's. It's it A's. is. It's the A's. Eh, eh, eh. Yep. Can't help it. I That's... was just, well, I wasn't born this way, but I was raised <laughs> this way. <laughs> sure. I, I, North Carolina, we don't enunciate. So I'm, I'm from there. And every now and then, like when I get, when I get really into things, the accent will come out. Or every time I go home and talk to family for any amount of time, it just sinks in. And yeah. I, like, I don't normally talk like that. But uh, what? I guess it just I do. comes out. No, that totally happens to me too. So see, this is like the the tame version yeah. of my voice <laughs> because I'm just I'm talking to somebody who is not from where my voice is from. But Fair. when I'm around my family, I get about ten decibels higher and uh, oh, yes. or louder, I should say. And yeah, those sure. A's come out loud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, nothing wrong with that. I think accents he- are awesome. They are very interesting, especially, I mean, the United States is big, but yeah. you go in any direction and people sound different from you, and it's very cool to hear. It really is. I I mean, I talk about it almost on every show now just because I'm obsessed with it, but I was in Ireland uh, mm. a couple years ago now, and just that tiny little island, there are vastly different accents. Like, just yeah. driving three three hours north from Dublin to Belfast, totally different accents. It's like, amazing, wow. isn't it? It is. I actually went on my honeymoon to, we spent two weeks in the UK, so we were in England, Ireland, and Scotland. Um, we only were in Dublin, and I can say that I understood everybody in Dublin, so that was okay. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and we stayed in Salisbury in England, that was also okay. But we went to this tiny island uh, off of Scotland called Isla. I don't know if you are a whiskey connoisseur. I'm not, but my I husband love is. <laughs> So we went to the island, I don't know if you like Parks and Rec either, sure. where Ron Swanson goes oh, yes. to have his whiskey adventure. So we were on that island, and that's where we spent about five days of our honeymoon. And I understood 5% of the people <laughs> there. And it's like, I know you're speaking the same language as me, but there's such a such a barrier in being able to understand. And it's not just... The, the lingo that they use or any sort of different phrases. It's just that accent. I could not understand. It's yeah, rough. It's... It is rough. It's the same. In, there's a, there's a fishing village uh, called Port McGee. It's in the Southwest corner of Ireland. It's actually where you take the boat to Skellig Michael. Oh, and, cool. And there I couldn't understand a word they were saying at all. I went to a pub and like sat there and <laughs> eavesdropped on conversations it didn't matter because I couldn't understand any of it. I was like, I and will it, pick this up. I didn't. I didn't at yep. all. <laughs> and it goes both ways, too, because there was a restaurant that we were at, and I ordered, like, a cheeseburger or something super basic. And they just looked at me and smiled, didn't yep. understand a word I said. <laughs> I was like, this is so bizarre. We are speaking the same language, but we had to speak so much slower to yeah. be able to understand. So yeah, it's it's funny. <laughs> it is it is hilarious when you go other places and they I mean, it sounds weird. To, um so I don't mean it the way it's going to come out, but it's weird when they can't understand us because right. <laughs> it's like, oh, you know, it's just we're just speaking regularly where the same thing happened. I, I took my parents with me uh on the trip that we went on. And my mother same thing. She went to order something and she's like, "I, I, I what?" <laughs> like, she just asked for some chips which is fr- french fries over there and you're like yeah. what but you understand and it's just it's so funny accents are so funny it's classic and it all started with my little midwest twang <laughs> that's right that's right hey it works it works it, it's a little bit of flavor yeah so there <laughs> you said you were born in not illinois in illinois yes. but you're not were... in wisconsin huh Do you, so what, at what age did you move to Wisconsin, I yeah. moved here two months ago or three months ago. <laughs> what? Yeah, so for I real? was in. Yeah, seriously. So I was in Illinois for all my life, and I went to the University of Illinois. Wow. Uh, lived lived there for about eight years, and then we just 
said, we like to have a little change. So both of us, my husband and I work from home. So we have a lot of flexibility about where we can live, Yeah, which is awesome. Not many people get to do that. And we said, we want to live in Madison. So we did it. And here we are for two months wow. now. <laughs> two months. That is yep. amazing. I thought it would have been the other way around. Like you were born in Madison lived a lot of your life in Illinois and then went back to Madison. But you're like, wow, first time Madison just a few months ago. And the yeah. ac- so the accent is that infectious. It's that. Inf- well, I would say <laughs> the accent is Midwestern, not necessarily just Northern Midwestern. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> I mean, I've seen Fargo. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that's a, that's Minas- <laughs> like a Minnesota sounding accent. Yeah. So <laughs> that's even further north from me. I'm not that dramatic. Yeah, that Brian. was all, I know. <laughs> I mean, it's only been two months. So, I mean, we don't have right. any, we don't have enough data here to really tell if it's going to be. I'll I'll have you back on in a year. And we'll... <laughs> there and then see what I sound like. And if I sound the same, then we'll know. Yeah, we'll that see. it's. That I'll be okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You'll come on. Hey, Marge. Uh oh. Oh no. Abort. Abort. <laughs> so, uh, what have you what have you learned about Madison since getting up there? Is cheese that big a deal? Cheese is a big deal, and it should be because it's delicious up here. Fact. I don't know about even in Illinois. Like cheese isn't really you like it, but it's not a thing. Mm. And when you go to a grocery store up here and you go into that cheese aisle. They have a tiny little section for like Kraft and Sargento, mm-hmm. but then this huge chunk of it, it's like the biggest aisle in the whole store is the fanciest cheeses you'll ever see. And it's amazing. Really? So the cheese is really good. The curds, cheese curds. I don't know if you've had those before. I have. Cheese curds and are amazing. And they're even better here. Really? Well, so, take pride in your work. Yep. So that's really my two month home and it has the best cheese curds. So Not that's bad. really good. So if you have me on your show again in a year, you should also see if I now weigh 10,000 pounds yeah. from <laughs> only eating cheese. And also the beer is very good here. Really? So we've, yes, we've really enjoyed going to all the bars and not just the bars, but they also have a lot of breweries here. What? This place too. sounds amazing. It sounds magical. And there's also lakes. So you can go kayaking and hiking what? around those lakes. Yep. See, that's why I chose to move here because you know it's awesome. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Did you? Okay. Do you do you own a cheese head hat? Because no. And what do you do, Mallory? Won't. I what? will not. I well, first of all, I don't really care about football <gasps> at all. Oh, it's for Sorry. football. Cheese. Yeah. <laughs> right. They wear cheese heads when they go to Packers games. Oh, right. Oh, I thought they just wear cheese heads. No, they don't just walk around. <laughs> I would. Well, then you can do that whenever you decide to move to yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah. That can be your prerogative Lose to do all that. all respect of everyone immediately. Even in Wisconsin, they don't just walk around with their cheese heads on. I'm pretty sure it's only for Packers games that, makes, that they that do makes that. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so, no, I don't own a cheese head, and I don't care about football very much. But if I did, I Ditto. would still have to stick with the Chicago Bears because that's where I grew up. So that's, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I uh, I've been to Chicago. I it's have... a nice city. It's it's a city. <laughs> it is a city. I agree. I feel that way about cities myself. <laughs> yes, yes. Growing up in like a rural area and like farm places, and then even Naples, where where I live, is not like what well, is now. But just in the last like five six years, has gone very very city and it's suffocating. Mm-hmm. But I I went to Chicago. Uh, my brother was getting married in uh, I'm forgetting the name of it. Decatur. Oh, okay, that's far farther south. That's yes. like by Champagne. Yeah. Yes, it's far. Um, yes. but I was like, if we fly into Chicago, I can see the Bean, and it's like on my bucket list to see the Bean. Uh, mm. well, little did I know, it's near impossible to find parking anywhere in Chicago near the Bean. And when you do find it, it's $35. So I was like, oh, how bad do I want this? <laughs> Come to find out, $35 bad. And yep. the bean's pretty cool. The bean is pretty cool. Have you seen the, the bean? The bean is cool. Of course I've seen the bean. Well, I, mean, we, I have to ask drive. dumb questions at the top, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's not a dumb question, but it's, it's a question. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I've seen the bean many, many times. Um, 
the nice thing, I grew up in the suburbs, but you can always take a train down there. So ah. I've been going there since before I could even drive. Um, right on. So yeah, we would go and see the bean and go walk in that area, which is pretty cool. And I actually, uh, two summers ago, I spent uh, working at the Adler Planetarium down oh, right there. On. So I don't know if you've been to the museum campus of Chicago, but it's beautiful down there. They have um, right. so many like the Shedd Aquarium, the Field Museum, uh, the sh- and the Planetarium, which are all awesome to go see. Sure, sure. So that's actually a, a great segue. <laughs> you have a, uh, a, would you say your interests include astronomy? Would that be a correct would... sentence? <laughs> That would be a correct sentence, and it you could even take it a step further that my career is in astronomy. Yes. <laughs> so, oh. like, what I do my what I do during the day is astronomy. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. No, we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay, we we're gotta, getting there. We got to warm up. We got to warm up. Yes, but yes, so, my, I do have a big, big interest in astronomy. When did that start? Um, that's a good question, and I would say I if. <laughs> You must have practice at this. I mean, a couple, a couple. <laughs> Just one or two. Yeah, um, mostly myself. But yeah, but yeah, it was actually interesting because my, my parents moved uh, out of our childhood home about seven months ago. And while we were helping them pack up, we found a lot of my old childhood stuff. And one of the things in there included uh, my first telescope. So I got a telescope from my parents. I don't ever remember asking for it mm-hmm. or necessarily being interested, but they just gave me one. Um, And so with that telescope, I heard on the news, oh, there's going to be a lunar eclipse. And so I stayed up all night, watched a lunar eclipse for the first time. And I think I was about eight years old or so. Um, So I would say I was probably about eight. And it was because my parents took that leap and got me a telescope for whatever reason. They just decided they were going to do that. And it was a great thing because ever since then, I always had just an appreciation for science and uh, when I was in high school, I took my first physics class, so that really got me into the mathematicals more, uh, less, I'm looking at the stars and more, I'm trying to solve these problems side of astronomy, Sure. which was a big transition, but I loved them both, so it didn't take wow. long for me, and then I got to college, and here I am. <laughs> so, wait a minute, am I understanding this correctly, that you took a physics class, and we're like, I'm into this. Yeah, I was super into it. I loved it. <laughs> That's amazing because it's a. Uh, I don't want to say it's rare, but it's probably rare. <laughs> <laughs> but not everybody loves physics. But and I'm glad yeah, there are people that do. <laughs> Someone has to, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So it started with a telescope. What? That is it amazing. Did. A telescope I didn't even ask for, and now. Fate. I want all of them. <laughs> you, could, you could say the stars aligned. You could. You yeah. could say that, and it wouldn't be cliche at all. <laughs> uh, I, you'll learn that I only deal in cliches and puns. I can't help it. I, I hit dad mode at like eight. Uh, oh, we're really... well into dad mode then. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I am a fully developed non-child having dad. Uh, so <laughs> a telescope. Okay. Do you still have it? Uh, my parents, yeah, they still do have it. Oh, um, we put it in storage because, like I said, they just moved about six or seven months ago. So we found it and we kept it. So it's still there and we're not getting rid of it. <laughs> cool. Do you still have a telescope? I do. And it's much fancier now really? than that little one was. Yeah, my original one was what they call a refracting telescope. So it uses lenses in there. And it's kind of like what you imagine a pirate to look out of at okay. sea, one of those long <laughs> telescopes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so now I have a fancier one, which is called a reflector. And believe it or not, it uses mirrors because it reflects stuff, right? Really? That's how you remember. Ah. So, so mirrored telescopes are much nicer and they produce nicer images but they're heavier and bulkier so i have a big old telescope that i don't use as much as i would like but someday i will use it more sure sure okay uh wow i didn't know there were different kinds of telescopes which is why i have people on my show that can there teach you go. me things okay you learn something new all the time yeah i try my best <laughs> you, oh my god i have a guy who i think his episode will have been released right before this one. And he raises tortoises. Oh. And he's amazing. 
and and I learned so much about tortoises. And then when I found out that you're an astronomer, I was like, oh, yes, please come on my show because I know nothing about <laughs> any of this. So, okay, there's mirrored telescopes, and you said reflector? Reflector? Reflective? Well, those are the same thing. So mirrors what? and reflectors. Ooh, here we go. Right? Mirrors and reflectors. That's how you connect them. Got so it. So reflector telescopes mm -hmm. use mirrors. And then the original one that I had was a refractor, which refractor. uses lenses. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what are the benefits of both? Benefits of both. So like I was saying with the mirror telescopes, they produce just a lot cleaner of an image. Uh -huh. So uh, you can see things that are a lot fainter using those because you can make the mirrors a lot bigger than oh, you can okay. the lenses. Um, the smaller lens telescopes, they're really good for like for kids, basically, right. um, because you can hold them with your hands. For the most part, they're pretty light uh -huh. and they're portable and also they're pretty cheap. So if it breaks, you don't have to feel so bad about sure. that. Sure. OK, so your small one that you had wasn't one of those like with a tripod and like aimed up or it was. Um, you could picture. put it. You could put it on a tripod, mm -hmm. but it was light enough where you could also hold it with your hand. So it was pretty small. It probably, like, if you can imagine the diameter of the opening, it was probably, like, two inches or something like that. It was really small. Sure, sure. Okay. And is there, is having never used a telescope before. Is... Oh, my God. You need to go <sighs> find know. your local astronomy club, and I you know. need to look through a telescope because it will change your life. Go in the winter when, or in the fall when Saturn's up. I'm telling you, what? it'll change your Saturn life. Saturn is up in the fall? I'm pretty sure what? it is. <laughs> hey, anything you say during this talk, I'm taking as fact because I am completely, I have no idea. There you go. I mean, I'm not the best at remembering when everything's in the sky, but I'm pretty sure you can see Saturn in the fall and in the winter. That is insane. I did that like cereal box trick when the eclipse happened last oh, year. Oh, yeah. Wasn't that really cool? It, it was, except I, I think I did it wrong. <laughs> and I was like, I okay, I think I kind of see it. And I took a what picture. What do you mean? <laughs> well, I was like, I don't see the eclipse. I was expecting like this apocalypse sort of blackout of the sun. And then I took a picture of the outside of the box, like pointed at my head. And there were tiny little eclipses on the outside of the box. I don't hmm. know how I don't know how that happened, but I was like, oh wow, I was looking in the wrong place. It was on the outside of the box. Not on the <laughs> now inside. it makes wow, sense. So dumb. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, okay. So what was the interesting? I'm like painting this picture. So there are people that like are obsessed with fishing and they have like a ton of different reels and like tackle boxes and stuff. Do you have like mm -hmm. a bunch of different telescopes or have you uh, had a bunch? I've used a bunch of telescopes, mm -hmm. but t the nice ones are expensive. Of course. So I don't, I'm not like a telescope collector <laughs> or anything Pro like that. Probably have, best. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have one telescope. Uh, well, I guess I have two now that I know that I still have my original telescope, yeah. but the one that is at my house is like, uh, it's an eight inch. So it's got an eight inch diameter in the mirror and it's a reflector. Got it. So it's big. It's a big boy. It's like a cannon. <laughs> that is amazing. I love when people have like, uh, totems essentially, of yeah. <laughs> things that put them on their path. Mm -hmm. Like I, I had Ryan Donahoe on, uh, a while back. He's the host of the Forcecast, and he worked for ESPN for a while as a sports journalist, and he talked about when he was like, I don't know, five years old or so, really, really young, he had this uh, karaoke machine, mm -hmm. and he would watch basketball games and then like interview his parents with this little karaoke machine, and then f flash forward 15 years, he's working for ESPN interviewing LeBron James. Oh my God. His parents still have that karaoke machine. That's amazing. So it made me think of this with they still have your first telescopes, and now you're like an astronomer. It's right. pretty cool. It's pretty How does cool. it happen? No one knows. I it's know. just destiny. That's right. And I'm like way too sentimental for my own good, so I'm like, it's so beautiful. <laughs> it's so poetic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it just makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what was it about that first telescope? You're just looking up at space. Like what clicked? What's going through your head where you're like, oh, stars? But it was more than that. Do you remember? Yeah, it was that first lunar eclipse right. that I looked at. So I used to, I, I was a 
weird little kid. So I would watch the nine o'clock news every night Sweet. when I would go to bed. Um, and one night they said there's going to be a lunar eclipse. It's going to start at whatever, 1 a.m. And so I said, oh, mom, can I stay up with my new telescope and can I look at it? And she said, sure, go ahead and do it. So I was just sitting in my room with the telescope set up looking at the at the moon. Mm -hmm. And when it finally started, you just start seeing, even though it's a slow transition, you see that transition sure. of the moon starting to get darker. And it was a total eclipse. So you can actually, at the peak of it, see the moon turn red. Yes. And seeing that through a telescope was just... It just it is awe inspiring, really, because you don't really think much about the moon. It's there. It's up during the day. It's up during the night. It just right. does its thing. But when it eclipses, it's just it. Yeah, it's amazing to see. Sure, sure. And that kind of eclipse. I we had one. What was it? Maybe three years ago. Two, three years ago. It was like three, four in the morning, and the whole thing turned red over the course of like, I don't know, maybe a half hour to an hour, mm -hmm. and then went yeah. back to completely white right I, just a regular full moon <laughs> yeah that blew my mind because i work nights so i was out in it and i'm like what is going on it was crazy so the the exp now for those that do not know what is the difference between a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse the difference between a solar eclipse and a lunar eclipse so a solar eclipse is when the sun is eclipsed by the moon mm -hmm. and then a lunar eclipse is the opposite kind of so it's when the moon is eclipsed by the earth's shadow right which one is more rare um well i would say that's a good question it depends on what you mean by rare because both happen quite frequently mm -hmm. it's just a matter of location so solar eclipses are a lot more rare to see like there was just that big one last year and it was in it passed right through the Midwest and a lot of the continental United States. And that doesn't happen very frequently. Right. But lunar eclipses, those happen uh, a lot more frequently in the United States. But you can. So I don't really know how to answer that question. No, They're th both. That sounded about it. OK. Yeah. They're both good. really cool to see. But solar eclipses, I would say, are a lot harder to spot unless you're willing to travel to go sure. see them. It's a more specific trajectory. Do you have yep. to be directly in its path to see it? Mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. That that would that would make it. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. <laughs> okay. I'm into that. There so, you go. So you you saw this thing and then were you, from there on were you like I'm just going to keep looking at the stars and just had a fascination with it and then that grew into I want to be an astronomer or like cuz there's a difference between being really, really into something, and then having that moment where you're like, I want to do this. Yeah. So when I was a little kid, I think, well, I already said I used to love watching the news. I right. used to want to be a meteorologist. Okay. So I loved weather, and it, whenever there was like a thunderstorm coming or a tornado watch, I would always be watching the Weather Channel all the time. So sure. for the longest time, I wanted to be a meteorologist. Um, and I had a, I liked astronomy and I liked looking at the stars, but I wouldn't say I was like, when I grow up, I'm going to do astronomy or I'm going to teach people astronomy or do anything like that. Sure. Um, and then in high school, um, I don't really know if I necessarily wanted to be anything, but then I took that first physics class mm -hmm. of mine and I really liked it. Um, and then I went on to take like the honors physics the next year to see if I was actually good at it. And at that point, you're starting to think about, okay, I'm going to go to college. What am I going to apply for? What am I going to, what am I going to be? I'm 16 years old trying to figure it out. Yeah. Nobody knows what they're <laughs> going to be when they're 16. So sure. when I applied for college, I applied to be an aerospace engineer. What? Um, yeah, I'm I, contrary to I love beliefs, all of this. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm kind of smart. Um, <laughs> I couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I got accepted to study aerospace engineering and I hated it. I hated it <laughs> so much. It was not what I, I don't really know what I was expecting, but it was not what I expected. Sure. Um, so Less I stuck with that. More engineer. <laughs> I, yeah, it was a lot more engineering and like, let's talk about stress tensors and 
things Ooh, of like ma materials. Some people do, but not yeah. me. This was not for me. <laughs> sure. But um, but I decided uh, like for one of my elective classes, oh, I'll take this introductory astronomy course. And then I was just like, this is what I want to do. And, sure. you know, so going back and forth, back and forth, do I minor in it, stick with aerospace, even though I hate it, or do I do astronomy? And so I just did astronomy um, after I started my junior year uh, as an wow. aerospace engineer, and then I ended it in astronomy. So it was uh, it was a whirlwind of a year, that's for sure. Yeah, so you, you made sure you didn't want to do aerospace engineering. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> I was really, really sure yeah. by the end of it. It was not for me. <laughs> Man. Okay, so what goes into, as far as, like, classes goes, uh, into getting into astronomy like that? Like, being an astronomer, what do you have to take to do that? What are the building yeah. blocks? Yeah, so astronomy is basically applied physics. So you need to have a really strong background in physics. Mm -hmm. And also, um, beyond that, just being able to do the calculations, you have to have an intuition for how things interact with each other. So a lot of astronomy is figuring out, um, like a big thing in astronomy right now is exoplanets and your mm -hmm. ex exoplanets in case anybody doesn't know are planets that are orbiting around stars that are not the sun. So oh. we're looking for those, it, they, it stands for extrasolar planets, but exoplanets sure. sounds so much cooler. Way cooler. <laughs> so a lot of what people are trying to do right now are to understand the properties of those exoplanets. So determining the mass of the exoplanet, the radius of it, its density. So you can determine if it's made out of like stone or if it's made out of gas or sure. something like that. And people right now are actually trying to determine what the atmospheres are like on these planets by uh, looking at something that's called their spectrum. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's just something that's really cool. So to be an astronomer, you have to have that sort of intuition about physics, not just understanding the technical parts of it, the computational parts, but being able to take those principles and visualize it, which is not always an easy thing to do. It requires a lot of thinking and existential crises. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. That's, yeah. a, that's one thing when you start thinking about space, uh, you're like, hmm. There's a lot of it out there. Oh, and that's, God. And that's freaky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you think about it's also crazy when you think about uh, anything in space with, you know, physical properties, because we have this idea like, I mean, obviously, context wise, you're on the planet, you look out into the stars and you have this almost at least me, this like mystical view, you know, of these stars and this explosions mm -hmm. and things. But at the end of the day, you're like, OK, they're rocks. And then the fact that I never put two and two together, that's so much in space revolves around physics and the mm -hmm. understanding of all these things. That is crazy. Yeah. It's what I like to call a cosmic perspective. Makes you feel very small. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it gives you a lot more uh, appreciation for how insignificant things are. And sometimes that's unsettling, but sometimes that's also very comforting. But all of that is not, it's not whimsical. It depends on mm -hmm. physical properties, the physics that we understand on Earth, which is pretty cool. Sure. So what? how would you describe what exactly astronomers do as far as like a day-to-day -day sort of thing? Like you, is it, you said right now exoplanets is like a big thing? Yeah. So there's a few big things right now going on in astronomy. Mm -hmm. um, exoplanets is definitely one of them. So it is mostly focused on not just identifying what where those planets are. Mm -hmm. So looking at a star and seeing, oh, this has a little dip in its light curve. So that means that there is a planet there. Um, but also, like I was kind of saying before, identifying the properties mm -hmm. of those exoplanets. Um, and if they're in systems that have multiple planets in there. So like our solar system has a bunch of planets going around the sun. Right. Um, do do other suns or other stars also have that same uh, sort of system sort of set up like our solar system does. So it's really testing what we understand about solar systems by looking at other ones. 
Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. So that's, so that's one big thing. Another big thing that you probably have heard of because it's so mystical sounding is dark energy. Yes. So, um, what I mostly focus on astronomy education now, mm -hmm. but when I was doing astronomy research, it was focused on, um, trying to understand the properties of dark energy, which newsflash, we don't know anything about it. <laughs> it's very, <laughs> it's very mysterious. Hence it's very mysterious name. Sure. Um, so we try to understand dark energy, which is the name that we give the expansion of the universe. Mm -hmm. So the universe is expanding, the space is expanding, but that space is accelerating in its expansion, which is weird and unexpected. Also terrifying. <laughs> also a little scary. <laughs> so, um, so astronomers are trying to understand how that dark energy is changing over time. And then uh, from there, what that means for the fate of the universe. Sure. Man, so, that is so it's crazy. a big question. It's a big question. <laughs> yeah. How do you even attack something like that? It's not like you can get some here and be like, oh, hey, I understand it now. Right. Because we don't even necessarily know what it is that's sure. driving this expansion. We're just trying to, to, understand how it is changing the acceleration of or the expansions acceleration and from there try to come up with ideas and then test those ideas to see if that can be an explanation for what dark energy is it's very complicated <laughs> sure sure uh w wow man this is going to be the most like there's going to be so many times i'm warning you now where i'm just going to go huh i just have to let that sit for a second Right, dark energy. Oof. Yeah, man, to think, wow. Okay, so what is the difference between an astronomer and an astrophysicist, being that um, there's so much physics involved in astronomy? Um, I would say that that is, it's kind of like a pedantic difference. So it's mostly okay. just astronomers versus astrophysicists who want to make the differentiation. And so I would sure. say it's probably the difference between a theorist and an observer, Oh, okay. um, so there's a, a long battle between these two um, oh, and, an, and a, an observer is exactly what it sounds like. So it's somebody who goes and takes observations at the super fancy telescopes like in Hawaii or in Chile mm -hmm. um, and they make observations and from those observations they can make predictions and tell us a little bit something new about the universe. Sure. Um, and theorists are the ones who are on a more mathematical side of astronomy. So taking the tried and true uh, theorems like relativity, taking those and applying it to see if we can make those predictions before actually taking the observations. Um, so really the two go together, but oftentimes you have a person who is a theorist and a person who is an observer and uh -huh. they work together as a team. The theorist develops this prediction, and then the observer goes out and sees if they can find observational evidence for that prediction, gotcha. which is pretty cool. It yeah. is. It's a good good uh, symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. That's how it works ideally. A lot of times they're <laughs> separated from each other. They're like, oh, you don't understand anything about observing. That's right. Uh, I was an observer myself, so Wait, there you I, go. I understand. <laughs> You're like, I'm about the facts. And they're like, you don't That's understand. Right. That's possible. It's like, I understand <laughs> the realm of possibility, but I also understand statistics. And you're right. wrong. <laughs> Numbers versus what I see. That's what do right. I believe? <laughs> it's very tricky. That's right. Man, you guys are terrifying. <laughs> Wait, who, oh. <laughs> who's, who's responsible for being like, well, you know, the sun's expanding. And one day, it's not good. It's not good Who's at all. responsible for that? I yeah. don't think, I think it's <laughs> physics that's responsible for that. That was a test. You are very yeah. much about the numbers. <laughs> that was the answer I expected. There you so, go. <laughs> how, do, how do you feel about Pluto? About it not being a planet yeah. anymore? And, then, and I... then it was for a little, and then it isn't? And yeah. what's happening? And it's actually something that's close to Illinois' heart because Clyde Tombaugh is the man who discovered it. Yeah. Uh, he's actually from Wheaton, Illinois, which is quite close to where I grew up. Hey. Um, and in Illinois, it's a really pedantic law, but when Pluto is in the night sky, it is technically a planet in Illinois. <laughs> well, is it really? 
<laughs> yeah, no joke. If it's visible in the night sky, Pluto is a planet in Illinois. So if you're upset about it, not officially being a planet by the definition of what a planet is, sure. uh, just go to Illinois and you'll be fine. <laughs> how, how how was it a planet for so long and then not a planet? Because yeah. I, I, was, I was in, I want to say it was my sophomore year in high school when they like officially declared it. Because I remember being in forensics class and the science teacher next to us came in and goes, well, Pluto's not a planet anymore. We're like, what <laughs> is happening? Oh, my God. Yeah, so basically what happened is a bunch of astronomers get together in a group that's called the International Astronomical Union. Union. And what they do there is they try to compile, it's almost like a style guide for astronomy. So coming to terms with definitions, making sure we're all on the same page of understanding about certain topics so that mm -hmm. when we try to convey ideas to people that might not understand astronomy, we're conveying them in a way that's consistent and makes sense. Ah. So we finally came upon, uh, we, we came to an agreement about what, a planet is and a lot of it has changed from the time when Pluto was first discovered because we know a lot more about how planets are formed oh. now and it's mostly by observing extrasolar planets understanding how our solar system formed and so what really did it for Pluto was the discovery of planets in quotes beyond <laughs> Pluto's orbit that were bigger than Pluto Oh, so we, yeah. So we discovered quite a few. Um, these are also dwarf planets beyond the orbit of Pluto that are bigger than Pluto. So those would also all have to be planets if Pluto was still considered a planet. Um, an additional thing is one of the one of the parts of the definition of a planet is that it has to have cleared its path around the sun. So if you look at Pluto, mm -hmm. Pluto has a couple of moons that are with it, mm -hmm. and its moons are very similar in size to Pluto. Uh, so could you say that the orbital path is clear <laughs> sure. when there's a couple of objects of similar size also orbiting in that same path? So that's that's part of what did did Pluto in. That makes sense. Just just didn't work out for him. <laughs> yeah, he was in the cool club for as long as he could, and then yeah, they he found made out. it like seventy years. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's a good chunk of time. Good chunk. Mm -hmm. of, can you imagine, like, man, <laughs> he was in it long. <laughs> he was in it long enough just to be on like everyone's solar system projects, and we're like, hey, what are you doing here? And that's basically what <laughs> happened. Yep, See, get out of here. I shrimp. never knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew that that's what actually happened. I just accepted it because people smarter than me said it. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so, wow. So what is the coolest thing you've ever seen up there? In the skies? Correct. I'm trying to, I'm trying to put it poetically. Up, yeah. That, up it there. Was up there. <laughs> down yonder. Down yonder. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a hard question because there's a lot of things that are really cool to look at. Mm-hmm but you appreciate them for what they are, not necessarily for visually what you see. Sure. So um, one of the most beautiful things to look at through a telescope is Saturn. Um, it looks almost exactly like you would imagine it to. You can make out the ring system that's what? going around it, and on a really clear night you can see the gap between the planet and the rings. Sure. What? So that's a beautiful thing to see, and you can even see that with a very – basic telescope you don't need to have like a professional grade telescope to be able to see that um so saturn is definitely one of the most beautiful objects to look at in the night sky and one of my favorite things is i've done a lot of public observing sessions so mm -hmm. opening up telescopes for the public to be able to look at them and whenever a person sees saturn for the first time they're always like is that a sticker yeah. like what is that <laughs> they can't believe that it's real because it looks it looks surreal, really. So yeah. that is definitely one of the most beautiful, but probably the coolest thing I ever saw through a telescope. Um, when I was doing astronomy research and making observations, there was a supernova in January of 2014 that you could actually see with the, well, you couldn't see it with the naked eye, you could see it with the telescope from, mm -hmm. from Earth, which is amazing. Yeah. So we actually were able to, 
take a couple images on a, on a telescope we had on campus and observe this supernova that was, you know, super far away. Um, so that was probably the coolest thing that I've ever observed. And what was so cool about it is there's a, at the U of I campus, there is a historic telescope there that's like, at this point, 121 years old or something like that. It's a super old telescope, and that's the telescope that we observed the supernova with. So it was really special. Wow, that's cool. Mm -hmm. I, I, I must admit, uh, Saturn was my favorite planet growing up. You know, the, I don't know why I had a favorite planet, but I did. And I Who like, doesn't? Yeah. It's a great one. <laughs> yeah, right. Dude, there's rings on it. It's like the different one. It's I, glorious. That's really cool that you've seen it. Mm -hmm. I, I you could see it too. I'm telling you, find that local Astro Society and just drop on in. I'm going to have to now. I didn't know it existed, mm -hmm. but I'm glad you're here. To I'm, I'm sure that it does. <laughs> yeah, it has to. It has to. So, wow. Okay. The, see, those are very two very good picks. Uh, Thanks. So at what point did you know that you wanted to teach? Because that's a very specific thing to do with a passion. Like yeah. It's, it's one thing to just enjoy it on your own. It's another to want to impart that. Yeah. So um, even though I was doing what sounds like really cool astronomy research, so I was... <laughs> I was observing type 1a supernovae, which are just a special type of supernova that help us understand the properties of dark energy. Mm -hmm. See, it sounds really cool, right? It does. Didn't it, it was a little it was a little rough and I wasn't I wouldn't say I was bad at it, but it was taking me longer to be good at it mm -hmm. than some people like my advisors wanted. Sure. So um, during that time, I was also teaching, working as a teaching assistant for the department. So I was teaching astronomy to undergraduate students at the university. And from there, I just really felt like I could have this really strong connection with people sure. about astronomy, get them excited about it. Um, and then there was there was a woman who came to give a colloquium at the university, and it was about astronomy education. Um, and so after listening to her talk, I went up and spoke with her a little bit after. And then I ended up working with her to study um, uh, astronomy education. So what students understand about the fate of the universe, which is really closely tied to dark energy and the composition of the universe. Mm -hmm. So I worked with her to study that. Um, and that's what my master's thesis was on and things like that. Um, so I was really into the teaching aspect of it. I really liked doing education research. It was really interesting to me to see and try to understand what people know about astronomy just based on what they hear in, in media or what they've read online or things like that. And there's just a huge amount of misconceptions about yes. astronomy. Um, which, I mean, how could there not be? It's a difficult subject to understand. And when people are presenting it inaccurately, what else are you supposed to do besides Have be wrong about it? <laughs> hey, there you go. <laughs> right. Oh, man. Um, but yeah, so it was just that mixture of education research, doing public outreach and teaching at the university level that really got it just solidified it to me that that's the area that I want to go in instead of focusing. It's kind of more of like a solitude, a solitary life sure. when you're doing observations and you have friends and things like that, but your research is your own. Sure. Sure. And with this, I felt like I was sharing my research with the people that I was teaching. So that was, that was something that was really special. So that's the direction, you know, no, no paths are straight and mine was extra extra wiggly so <laughs> sure those make for the better stories though that's right you know I, i'm all about the story so that's <laughs> pretty cool so you am am i not putting these two together the place that you went to school and graduated from is the place that you went back to and taught it was the place that i taught while i was a student Oh, so sweet. i was a i was a graduate student and so as a graduate student they let you teach stuff um, oh. so part of my, my deal, so I didn't have to pay tuition Smart. was that I would teach. So I taught and I loved it. It was great. <laughs> sure. So do, when you're teaching at a college that you're currently attending, 
Is mm-hmm. it the same level of teaching in that like you have to make these lesson plans and it's like this whole as someone who knows nothing about any of this. <laughs> sure. Uh, what what goes into teaching a college class while you are also in college? Yeah, so it's a lot of work. Yes, I'll tell you that sounds much. Sounds like uh, it. In a lot of cases, when you're a teaching assistant, you um, help an instructor or you help the professor grade papers and you hold office hours to answer student questions. Mm-hmm. And occasionally you'll run a discussion section. Okay. Um, but because I had such an interest in public outreach and observing, uh, the department wanted me to teach an introductory observing course for undergraduate students. So that required a lot more preparation because I not everybody was on the same page as each other so I would give like a little introductory spiel I guess you could say about the topic that we were going to be covering and then from there go on to observing and doing like computer-based labs and things like that okay yeah so there was a lot of preparation for for that for sure Sure. and then there's grading because you're grading labs but that stuff's all kind of boring (laughs) of course of course Ah, that is fascinating man so what are your thoughts on elon musk elon musk well i'm not necessarily a huge fan of privatizing space travel fair um but i appreciate what he's doing in lieu of nasa having the proper funding to be able to to study and travel to space as they should. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's kind of gimmicky, isn't he? I mean, he's, sell- <laughs> he's selling flamethrowers now. So that's- is he really? I mean, yeah, he did this thing where he wanted to like fund a rocket. So he he had where if you, I think it was five, four or five hundred dollars, and he made his own flamethrowers. It was like if you donate to this campaign, you get a flamethrower. I was like, oh man. It, He's, Sounds dangerous. It's a, a definitely, but he's like, I feel like he's the Willy Wonka of billionaires. You know what I mean? He's like, he's kind, I, I he like seems rockets. Kind of whimsical. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the whole idea that he wants to colonize Mars. Uh, yeah. How do you, how, what do you think about that? <laughs> I'll say good luck to you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I Elon Musk. I feel like it's great to have visionaries and people who want to keep pushing us sure. forward and keep looking for something new to do. Um, mm-hmm. It would just be great if there was public support for that in our government showing public support for the sciences in that sort of way. Sure. I like I like for science to be there for the sake of science, not necessarily for a profitable reason. Like, for example, when uh, they just recently launched that rocket into space that had like a mannequin on it or a something car. like that. <laughs> but yeah, but it was it was in a Tesla. Yes. And so it's just like, <laughs> OK, it's... you couldn't just send it to space. You had to be like all showy yeah, the about most expensive it. expensive ad ever. Of all time. And I don't want to buy a Tesla. So you didn't succeed, sir. True. Um, true. I shouldn't be hating on him so much because I appreciate what he does. Right. But I, I just, I do find him gimmicky and a little, you know. That is okay. I, You're an astronomer. Yeah. That's about the facts, not the theories. And, uh, you know, I support this. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to have a discussion Let's about facts <gasps> and theories. Yes. And Let's dive why in. colloquially... People say theories as things that are almost untested, not true, not uh-huh. verified. So in the sciences, mm-hmm. theories are things that are tested, tr- true right. in quotes. Versus yeah, so, like a theory versus a hypothesis. Right, exactly. So in when we speak colloquially, you say, oh, that's just a theory. And you're throwing away somebody's idea because you think it's unsubstantiated, unverified. Right. But in the sciences, the theory is something that has been well tested. So I will say, if anyone is, will listen to me yeah. at all, <laughs> when somebody says, I have a theory about this and they are a scientist, then you should really listen to them because it's verified and substantiated. Correct. A theory is, and people use theory as a hypothesis when they speak about it colloquially. It's like I have, uh, I have like when they say this is, I have a theory about this, but it's untested. Therefore, it's a hypothesis. Or am I doing this wrong? Yeah, 
No, no, that's that's right. But basically, they just mean I have an idea yeah, yeah, <laughs> about yeah. this because it's usually not scientific <laughs> when they're sure. trying to say things. They're just like, oh, let me let me throw this theory at you. But they just mean I have an idea and I'm just going to spew it <laughs> sure. right now. I, You know what? I totally understand and respect that. So when did you get into podcasting? Podcasting for me started about six years ago. So when they first made the announcement about um, Star Wars coming out, that it was being bought by Disney, that we were going to get a new episode, I was like, I need to, I need to be on the ball with this news. I need to know everything that's happening. So yeah. I decided to join Twitter. I wasn't on Twitter until until then. So I joined and I started following like as many different Star Wars places as I could. Um, mm -hmm. And then I saw somebody had posted something and it happened to be far, far away radio. They posted um, for somebody to be a writer for them. So I wrote a couple of blog posts um, and then I guess they liked my spunky attitude enough where they said, hey, why sure. don't you come be a guest on the show? Um, and so from there I was a guest and then they liked me enough. They liked this voice. They thought it could sell, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it worked. It worked. It worked out. So yeah. So I just happened to join Twitter, happened to write a couple blogs and here I, here I am still podcasting all these years later. That is amazing. So far, far away radio was your, your introduction. Like that was your first podcast. Yeah, it was my first and what my only Star Wars podcast that yeah. I've been a part of. Yep. Right on, right on. And you have another show that I recently became aware of and thoroughly enjoy, <laughs> The Yay, Avatar thank State. You. Yes. So I've loved Avatar The Last Airbender since it came out when I was like 15 years old. Yeah. Um, so I super loved it. And I was talking with Austin Blankenship, who I knew through Far, Far Away Radio, and we both loved the show. Mm -hmm. but then we discovered that a couple of our friends had never seen it before. Yeah. And I was I was shocked. I yeah. couldn't believe Unacceptable. it. Unacceptable. It was not acceptable. So I had to change that. Um, so we decided that we were going to have this this podcast where Austin and I would uh, walk our two friends, Meg and Jonathan, through the entire series. And, of course, there's lots of hijinks along the way, including tons of misleading and yeah. me just being <laughs> super, super evil the it, whole time. It's great. <laughs> it is a lot of fun. If Even if you haven't seen the show, just being able to watch it along with people, because that's something that made the show so special for me when I was first watching it is that I wasn't in an online fandom or anything, but a lot of my friends at school watched the show. So we would talk about it and enjoy it together. Sure. So it's just having that, that relationship, being able to share it with people when you're watching a show for the first time, even when the show is, you know, 10 years old. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I have a, a, a Star Wars podcast called Brian and David talk Star Wars, and he's <laughs> never seen the Clone Wars. So we really? we watch and review every episode of the Clone Wars, and I'm like, there you go. what do you, what do you think of that, huh? Krell's kind of he's kind of crazy, isn't he? Hmm. He you... seems like a good guy, doesn't he? Yeah. That Krell? <laughs> Where do you think this is gonna go? <laughs> he's trustworthy. I really yeah. think it. Yeah. He's not gonna die. That guy. God. I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> God, it made me so mad. To, oh. to, uh, but Avatar, Avatar is, in my opinion, possibly the greatest animated show of all time. I adore my logo for this show is actually a cabbage. <laughs> you love your cabbage corp. Oh my god, you have no <laughs> idea. That costume changed my life. Uh it's so good. And so much confidence you get when you so wear it. So much confidence. <laughs> I built the cart as well. I had like a straight on That's like wooden great. cart. Yeah. I it was it was amazing. It was amazing. And now you started Cora. <laughs> That's Her. right. So we finished watching The Last Airbender. Um and that took a lot of time to go through i i oh, yeah. don't know i don't know if i ever shared my show notes with anybody to see but i would write out i would like write out my whole script of what i was gonna say the whole time so i would have like 10 pages of show notes sure. to go through so working on that was a lot it took a lot of time and we needed a little break after that <laughs> so we took about like a four or five month break and we kept getting emails and people were tweeting at us, when are you going to do Cora? When are you, you know, please do it. And after a while, you're like, people actually liked that enough for us to want to do it. Why don't we do it? And we had so much fun making it 
too, even though it was a lot of work. Sure. It was so much fun. So um, just we released our first episode a couple weeks ago. And it's great. Um, thank you. And pretty soon we're going to be releasing our second one. So we're right on track with that. But we're doing it a little differently this time. So when we watched The Last Airbender, it was much more about uh, like a chronology of events. So we would talk about literally everything that mm-hmm. happened. Sure. Very, very chronological. But Cora lends itself so much more to the themes it of does. the show that if you're just watching it for the events, you're going to miss so much of it. Um, so we're focusing a lot more on themes, which one makes the show note writing a lot easier because we're just focusing on ideas as opposed to this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Sure. Um, so it's been really fun. And of course there's plenty of hijinks and shipping and all that good stuff for, for everybody to enjoy in Cora as well. Oh yes. I'll be very interested to see how book two goes. Oh (laughs) God. Because uh, things go a little Miyazaki. Uh, yeah, things are going to get a, totally crazy. And I, right before we started the show, I rewatched it in about the span of two weeks. So I watched all four seasons sweet. in two weeks. And let me tell you, that's an emotional roller coaster <laughs> to oh, do yeah. that. There is a lot, a lot going on in that show. And it's like, I think I was saying to Austin not too long ago, it's like the best fanfic ever written it because it, it gets your emotions <laughs> going so strongly every single time you watch it. So I really appreciate what they did there for sure. I, when I watch movies in real life, like I never cry unless something really bad happens, but like in movies, it's not hard for me to get Mm -hmm. emotional. That's like cathartic for me. And when, when I tell people like, Oh, this movie made me cry. What I mean is like waters in my eyes, right? It takes, it takes a lot for tears to fall. Right. Cause normally Mm -hmm. I could be like, no, 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 get back in there. Strength. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, my, my tear <laughs> ducts were removed in the war. Uh, so, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> uh, but uh, the first time I ever watched something in like legit, like, oh no, I can't stop crying, was actually Avatar: The Last Airbender, mm. which is crazy because it's an animated show, and it took me by surprise. It's and not crazy. Was it Tales of Bossing Say? It was. Yep, it was at the very <laughs> end with Iroh singing to his son. And oh, okay. you know what's crazy about that? I'd seen it once before, and it didn't make me cry. I was like, wow, that's heartbreaking. But the Sometimes... second time I watched it, it just it broke me, man. I couldn't handle it. When I realized that the song that he's singing to the gravestone is the same song he sang to the little boy to calm it's him too down. too much. I See, like, now I can't, I can't even listen to you talk about couldn't. it because it makes me too emotional i couldn't do to it talk about <laughs> and that it, it it broke me that and uh kubo do you ever see kubo in the two strings i haven't no kubo broke me couldn't handle oh. it <laughs> Could, couldn't handle it i am i am man enough to admit that i couldn't stop crying like i was with my fiance and i was like we gotta we gotta we gotta talk about something else i just can't <laughs> oh, i just need a moment away yeah, from this. like a no. lot like just talk about something else you just gotta let those feelings flow through you sometimes. Yes, you know? But yeah, Cora and I won't say the specifics about it in case any of my friends who have not seen it yes. have listened. But the season finale of book one of Cora. Oh yeah. Nope, can't even handle it. <laughs> it's good stuff. It's good stuff. You it's want, great. You want great to feel? Stuff. You want to feel? <laughs> yeah, you want to feel something. You're gonna feel it every but, time you think about it. That's right. <laughs> Uh, speaking of things you can't probably talk about, let's be as vague as possible. Um, okay. you're, you're involved in a, in a particular, um, audio project mm-hmm. that is not a podcast. That, okay. That is, uh, perhaps called Convergence, perhaps not. Maybe. Um, what can you say about it? I can say that that project is currently on hiatus okay. right now. Fair. But maybe you'll be hearing something about it in the next couple of months. <laughs> okay. Okay. That I... yeah, and, and that's all I can really say. But that's not me being secretive. That's just the truth. all there is right <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair. I had to, you know. Yes. You can, you no cannot, problem. You can't not. Um, but can you believe we've been talking for over an hour already? Oh my God, we're chatty little Kathy's going time, on here. Time flies when you're actually having a conversation. I've learned. 
It's so true. And I just have my two of my dogs are sleeping and we're fostering a dog and she's just staring at me in her kennel. <laughs> like, how dare you leave me in here for so long? That's right. like, <laughs> what have you done? What are you doing up there? Stop talking to nobody. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that is right. Well, you know what? Thank you so much for coming on. I had a good time. I hope you did as well. Yeah, I definitely did. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was great. Of course. Uh, where can people find you online? So you can follow me on Twitter at Mallory Conlon. So original. I know. <laughs> kind and that's of, pretty yeah. much it's it. You. <laughs> it's me. That's all I can say. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the only place where I'm on social media. So there you go. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you again. I appreciate it. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of uh, The Interesting Podcast. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Jedi Brian. If you want to follow the show, it's at Pot of Interest on Twitter. And uh, if you enjoyed this, uh, if you wouldn't mind, go to iTunes and give it a five-star rating. That pushes us to the front of uh, the iTunes algorithm, and it helps book guests. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate you listening. Until next time, be well.